My name is Jen Koppen. I'm the moderator for today's event. Our webinar today is Cultural Integration Best Practices for M&A Transactions. Our webinars are dedicated to helping you in your planning and execution during the post-merger integration process. I'll talk briefly before the, we end today about our previous and upcoming webinars and how you can register. Before we begin, I'm gonna go through some quick housekeeping items. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type them into the Q&A box. It should be located at the top or bottom of your screen. Feel free to type in your questions at any time so we can add them to the Q&A list. Also a reminder that a recording of this webinar will be sent to you and made available on our website at gpmip.com. I'd like to introduce our presenters. Scott Whitaker, our partner in the US, has extensive experience in all aspects of merger and post acquisition integration and has advised clients across dozens of industry sectors. He's a recognized expert in M&A and has authored the books Cross-Border Mergers and Acquisitions and the Mergers and Acquisitions Integration Handbook. Christoph Van Gampler is our European partner in Benelux. Christoph is a hands-on expert in mergers, integrations, and carve-outs with a focus on culture and finance. He co-authored the books Cross-Border Mergers and Acquisitions and Mergers and Acquisitions, A Practitioner's Guide to Successful Deals. Monique Verdusco an associate in the U.S. is an expert at assessing, identifying, and executing cost-effective business solutions centered around M&A capabilities. She has worked on deals across the globe, including Canada, the U.S., and Belgium. I turn it over to Scott Whitaker. Thank you, Jen. Uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, the title of the webinar, as you know, is called Cultural Integration Best Practices for M&A Transactions. Uh, what we want to get into today um, is the acknowledgement that most integration activity is rightly centered around people, process, and technology integration, but what about culture? So today we're going to explore how to define culture to make your efforts meaningful and actionable for key stakeholders, how to ensure the people part of integration does not get overlooked even for small acquisitions, how to incorporate cultural assessments into your integration planning regimen and when, and what to measure and how to follow up to keep employees informed and engaged. Um, you know, before we move on, I want to acknowledge that um, we know things for all of us are far from business as usual at the moment. Um, we know schedules have been affected. Uh, we're glad you're here today. Um, you know, we had talked earlier in the week whether or not we should continue with the webinar, but um, you know, we thought you know, now more than ever, we probably have a little time freed up on calendars for learning and development. Um, so we decided to stick to our plan, keep this as scheduled, um, and we will stick to the original topic. I don't think there's, uh, we're not trying to make any attempt to tie in current events. I think that would be impossible and, and frankly a disservice to both, both the topics. Um, but We'll, we'll forge ahead. We hope folks are, are, are safe at home or wherever they're dialed in from and uh, hope you get uh, a lot out of uh, today's uh, webinar. Next slide, please. Thanks, Scott. Um, Scott will also provide some background on GPMIP partners. Thanks, Jen. Uh, so we, we, I wanted to provide some background on how and where we draw our experience from so you can understand our perspective on culture and the roles it plays for us in most M&A transaction scenarios. We understand you're spending a precious hour of time on something like a webinar. You wanna feel confident that you're hearing from experts. Uh, so the purpose of the next few slides is to do just that so you can understand exactly where we're coming from based on the work that we do. Um, let me start by explaining that our work includes over 375 projects to date across dozens of sectors sectors, for public and private companies, and for a wide, wide range of deal sizes, um, you know, mega mergers down to small PE platform add-ons. Uh, we've worked in over 35 countries, and our point of view on culture is drawn from these experiences and from those of our associate, associates and others who are on the front lines with us. Jen, next slide, please. So our cultural work experience is informed by many different kinds of companies, uh, public, private, large, small, new, um, old, and so forth. Um, despite all these differences, there are many common themes that arise when dealing with cultural integration. 
And our focus today will be on the most common scenarios and how to manage through them. Next slide, Jim. You know, as a proof point to how important culture is in any M&A transaction, you know, our published books include dedicated chapters on cultural related topics. Um, we take it seriously. We make sure our clients do as well when we work together. Um, Jen will talk a little bit more about um, something that we have for you at the end of the webinar. Um, but for those doing uh, any M&A, especially cross-border M&A, the chapter in the second book, I think is very helpful. Christoph um, authored just overview of navigating cross-border cultural nuances when doing M&A planning. But again, we take it seriously. Um, it factors in the work we do. Um, you cannot do put companies together without thinking about culture, period. All right, I'll turn it back over to Jen. Thanks, Scott. We'll turn to Christoph to offer some insight into defining culture. Thanks, Jen. Thanks, Scott. Good day. So um, my background, I'm a finance professional. I was investment manager for a family office in Manhattan. I have a big four background in audits and in M&A. And like so many people in the business, I noticed that the promise of the discounted cash flow model, that little Excel and the graph showing going upwards, often failed to materialize. So I got interested in, in the soft side of doing M&A. And culture is an important dimension of what makes M&A actually work. So let's define culture first. There are as many definitions of the world culture as there are focus areas and point of view. At Global PMI Partners, we use a definition that is geared towards the needs of M&A integration. So culture in an M&A environment can be defined as a combination of shared local and corporate norms, behavior, symbols, values, systems, and laws. So the definition we use makes it clear that culture is not something intangible. It is something that we can grasp. We can define behavior. We can identify symbols. We can observe values, systems, and laws. So cultural management is the systematic and facts-based management of differences between local and corporate cultural attributes. And the strength of an integration manager lies in the extent to which he can reinforce the positive elements and defuse any negative tendencies that can potentially lead to explosive situations. So on to the next slide, please. A couple of years ago, the Economist Intelligence Unit and Accenture did a global M&A survey. So they queried 10,000 managers in 73 countries. And the question that the respondents were asked to answer was about their top integration challenges. So what came out? of that survey, 33 or 32% of respondents found a challenge in defining a clear organizational structure. The same percentage founded a challenge to address cultural integration issues. Then 30% saw issues with leadership from top management, so clear leadership. And then the next item, the fourth most important one, was a good communication plan. So out of the top 10 responses, the top four with a mean of 30% were all related to human capital and granted many important issues come up in the other bucket, like a career a strategic rationale for the deal, a comprehensive integration master plan, risk management and dedicating enough resources to the to the effort but 
this shows actually the importance of cultural management, however you define it, organization, uh, regular culture, leadership, communicating to people. So uh, next slide, please. Jen, thank you. So why would that be culture? And I think it, it may be related to, to driving a car. At first, you're unconsciously unskilled. You don't actually know that you don't know how to drive a car. You, you think, you know, I can drive a bicycle, a car is probably not that difficult. And, and the analogy is in, in culture. You know, I can move around in the world around me. I understand people around me. I get it. I understand culture. But that is because you just interact with people within your same in, in the environment that you're very much used to. So the first thing is actually to realize that you may not know everything about culture across the globe, about values, about the ways people do things in other parts of the world. So then you become consciously unskilled. It's like the realization that, oh, there may be something here. Next step is then, to train yourself or your teams and to bring in the knowledge on how to deal with culture. It's again like driving a car. You're trying to become consciously skilled. You think about everything you need to do, uh, put your car in gear and, and, and do your indicators and so on. But you have to think about everything, but at least you're thinking about it and you're getting there. And eventually you become unconsciously skilled it's part of your dna to deal with culture to be aware of differences and i think this is a little bit what we see when we work on integrations with clients that um, our clients are across this spectrum from unconsciously skilled which is great to unconsciously unskilled and then we may have a little bit more difficulty of even making people aware of the importance of culture so uh, next slide, please. Thanks, Christoph. Um, we're going to move on to people presented by Scott. Thank you, Jen. Thanks, Christoph. Um, next, we'll talk about addressing the people part uh, of M&A in terms of prioritizing, understanding the drivers of change for cultural alignment. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, in most all the situations um, that we face, you know, our advice is to avoid trying to harmonize cultures, quote unquote. And, you know, a lot of times I'm sure we've all been in that meeting where, you know, once we get engaged, we see some early work on kind of goals of the transaction. And you might see things like, you know, create one unified culture um, spec'd out. And you think, um, oh boy, um, you know, there's the first kind of battle to, to dive into here because, you know, you really want to focus and prioritize where alignment is critical and then kind of understand the change drivers uh, to, to help facilitate that. Um, we take a very pragmatic approach to cultural integration um, and really focus on two big areas when it comes to people, prioritization, and then just understanding the change dynamic. Um, again, you know, you, when you hear the the, the language of, you know, full harmonization, creating one unified culture, it should be a bit of a red flag. This should not be your sole focus in an m &A scenario. And, and here's why. In terms of prioritization, you, you need to focus on the dimensions where alignment is critical, delivering on mission and business objectives. Let me stop there. One of the first things you need to do is make sure that you know that mission, you know, values, however you're articulating it, and and your uh, planning and the business objectives are solidified, clarified, and memorialized. That should that's a part of our initial pre-planning regimen that we do every time. Because if that's fuzzy or unknown, or you've got some competing interests, then you really have no kind of no no north star to tie to to help with what I'm gonna talk about next. Um, so that's, that's job one, obviously. 
And, and examples that I'll pull from, from our experience where you, you need to be aligned, quality and safety, for example. If, you, if you're miscalibrated there in terms of one company is you know, at a certain level, the other is below that, for example, you want to get those harmonized. That's a big thing. Um, and you know, it needs to be, and people support that. You're not gonna get a whole lot of arguments. Performance measurement is another one. Um, where going forward, you know, the, what was the method um, and maybe unspoken rules in one company, maybe the other company was a little bit more rigid and um, you know, quantitative, you know, that's an important thing to get aligned because people will notice that right away want to have some assurance that what they're doing um, and, and how it's being recorded and measured um, will you know, affect their trajectory in the organization. Um, if they don't know how that's going to be or when it's going to be harmonized, that's a, an anxiety creating situation. Communications for sure, frequency and transparency. That's your first opportunity right off the bat in your integration planning to communicate Openly, transparently, frequently, put messages um, that you know align messages to the right stakeholder audience in terms of the topics that they're most interested in, concerned about. Um, you want both companies doing that the same way. All the more reason to centralize that, especially in an integration planning scenario. You want it coming out of one person. The integration management office is always our recommendation. Next, avoid immediate and rigid alignment on mo minor policy differences. Um, you know, as tempting as it is to pick off low-hanging fruit things and think, you know, we want to harmonize our dress codes, um, our, telecom our telecommuting policies, minor HR personnel differences. There's a long list of these things that we've all um, are, are aware of. You know, those things um, will are largely trivial cultural elements. You will get to those in due time. Um, you know, I think it's not, just not an area to focus on right away. Um, and you know, some organizations that we work with are very rigid. They want that to be um, aligned immediately. And you know, some of our counsel a lot of times is, look, let's focus on the things that really matter. And let's park those as some kind of, kind of a, a longer term harmonization evaluation exercise, and we will get to them. It's just not something we ought to do right away. Um, understand the drivers of change and, and don't minimize them. You know, any changes in how you do a job, what is expected, who you work with, how performance is measured, creates anxiety. Um, you know, when coupled with minimal training, explanation, um, you know, communications, support, uh, people get frustrated and they disengage. Uh, you uh, must, in our roles, you, we must understand where change is happening. Um, tailor tailor the, the communications and change management support around it. Um, everyone always says to over communicate during transformative times, and MA is one of those times, but your communication needs to be tailored to the needs of specific stakeholder audiences. And you need to make sure you address those change questions. You know, what is changing? How does it affect me? What do I need to do different, et cetera? Um, think about those things um, with the people that you're dealing with, um, and especially those areas where, you know, the way I did a job before this is going to change, and, you know, explaining how and what people need to do different, what it means for them, et cetera. Next slide, please. Thanks, Scott. Let's change to Christoph Monique for the topic of measurement and follow-up. Thanks. Scott and Jen. So in the definition, um, we had a couple of elements that actually are highly measurable, local and corporate norms, behaviors, symbols, value systems, laws. So how do you start gathering facts? It's important that the acquirer knows about himself, knows what is my culture, what are the values? What's important for me? Where do I want to go to as a company? That in itself is already a difficult exercise and a good exercise because then you can start measuring and getting acquainted in a more familiar environment, uh, namely your own environment. 
then you gather gather facts about the target and you can do facts gathering about the target even pre-signing um, at global pmi partners we do a culture due diligence and then we compare the culture between acquirer and target of course you cannot you can only do so much before for signing, but it's more than uh, nothing. After closing, you can move to one-on-one -on -one interviews. You can create focus groups around certain cultural elements that are important. Those focus groups can have a, a global uh, footprint. They can be centered around specific functions. They can include top management and people across the organization. You can do surveys, you can do extensive online surveys, you can do simple face-to-face uh, -face surveys, and you can also solicit free input um, because it would be wrong to assume that whoever is leading the culture work stream knows everything that's going on. So it's a two-way communication. So facts gathering, we gather facts across a number of dimensions. We gather facts from the point of view of the employee. What's important for him culture-wise? What are his values? We look at it from the company's point of view. And this can be objective things about the company. It can also be the employee's perspective on the company. There's also the time dimension. Where are we now? Where do we want to go? And how fast do we want to get there? Then a little bit like Scott said, some cultural elements are dominant in your organization. And you may want to keep them that, like that or not, but you need to know what is dominant in the organization. Some things will be shared between the acquirer and the target, the same cultural traits. And some things, well, you may be lenient on. Also, like Scott said, either we'll address that later or it's just part of the national culture. Um, being in the city in London will require a different dress code than being an employee in Hawaii. And you don't want to switch the dress codes around. So, and then the last one, if you look at the cultural element, is it a positive and forcing element or is it potentially limiting where the company wants to go to in the future or in general? So more about the implications of this uh, a bit later, but Bonique will first guide you through assessments and diagnosing culture. Next slide, please, and Monique. Staff mentioned you can begin diagnosing culture throughout the entire m and life cycle. And as he just said, we will review the GPMIP approach on assessments in the next section. But here are five ways to start diagnosing initially. The first way is to listen to the organizational noise. There are many reasons at the beginning of an integration that you can start hearing feedback and rumors especially in the beginning, but it's important to figure out the root cause and how prevalent or systemic it is. This can be done um, initially, or in, and it can also uh, become more enunciated when there hasn't been a lot of communication from the leadership disseminated, because then staff start creating their own storylines. So it's really important to determine the root cause of that noise and why it's happening. The second way then is to look at your day one FAQs, the tone and how they're written by the leadership the reaction of the staff and the questions and how they're responding to them. Do the employees want to know the differences in the wallet issues as we refer to it or, or anything that's affecting how they're getting paid or their benefits? Any of the traditions that are changing within their environment and or the style of leader that they'll be reporting to? Just, but determining the reason for that tone. The third way is for you to begin to hear staff go from saying I or there to we. And naturally, it takes a bit of time to absorb all the changes and it's not uncommon to think that the way your company is doing it is the right way in the beginning. 
until people really start working through the change curve, respecting the differences and embracing why the companies were brought together in the deal, it's really hard for some people to comprehend that if they don't have the vision of why so that they can embrace the we. Keeping culture and change on the agenda is the fourth way to diagnose culture. There have been previous studies, as, as Scott and Christoph mentioned, to show that culture is often one of the top reasons companies struggle to attain the synergies of the deal when they're not addressed. And making sure that you are addressing concerns, providing staff opportunities to give feedback, meeting the leadership team is important, and really making you know, sure that they understand the vision and the mission, as Scott mentioned earlier, on why some of the decisions are being made and uh, to bring the groups together. And they can often make a difference and help you in, uh, gauge where the employees' mindsets are at. And then the fifth way is reviewing how to do the initial diagnosis is by looking at body language. Are they open to how others have been doing it or is their stance or face expressions closed off? Now, depending upon the amount of sites, uh, regions, time zones you're dealing with, that can be more arduous, but video conferencing and the tone of voice on the conference calls is also a helpful way to gauge that. If you can establish ways the group can see each other, interact, review business processes, or even sometimes just have an adult beverage, it can really begin help you building those relationships, which also, you know, ultimately achieve the synergies of the deal and, and help those items. In the next segment, we'll review our approach to cultural assessments. Thanks, Monique. Um, Monique and Christoph will also cover cultural assessment. So as Christoph mentioned, there are many ways to go about cultural assessments. Some use in-depth tools that can provide a lot of useful data, but some of them do come with a higher price tag. At GPMIP, we have an efficient four-step process. Uh, to summarize, we determine, one, what to measure, two, we send a survey, and uh, Christoph is gonna go over in a couple of slides some of, the, some of the ways to define some of that in more detail. Three, we gather the results, and then four, we create an action plan. But let me talk about that in a little bit more detail. When you're culture mapping, you need to determine what values and environmental differences there are that are important to your company. For example, is the communication in your company open or guarded? Are the leaders empowered or do they lead by instruction? Is, is the, you know, important in a, a pharmaceutical company to be uh, perfection or speed to market? There are around 15 to 20 elements that we try and measure. And in the next slide, Christoph will go over how to help the company determine what some of those measurements can be. Then we work with the leaders to determine who should receive the survey. It's often a lot more accurate and you can get the overall temperature of the company if it goes to all employees. But as, as Scott had mentioned earlier, sometimes you need to do that a little bit earlier in the process if the leadership wants to create an action plan to make sure that the people part of it are addressed earlier and that it's being done uh, by day one. After that survey goes out, then GPMIP gathers the results, as you can see here in the redacted visual examples. Uh, the results uh, in this example show you that the value and environmental cultural mapping were fairly aligned. And if you ask open-ended questions, then you have the ability to put action plans around what the top three concerns were or show the alignment for the top three items depending upon what those questions were that the company wanted to ask to address those cultural differences. So Christoph in the next slide will go over some of that additional detail. Thanks Monique. This slide is, is, um, is an example from a company where I just took a couple of value elements and I wanted to give the example here um, and, and, and from take it from a real life uh, company. So in the first column, you have your values. Second column, 
you have where the employee scores himself as being now. Uh, now I'm accountable. And in the third column, the employee scores the company. Hmm. No accountability in the company. So there's a discrepancy. And same thing with trust, employee, trust, company, nothing. Uh, trust, the column four, employee aspires still to, keep, to, to have a company where trust rules, but he also aspires for the company to be a company where trust is the basis of relations. So you can do that for so many cultural elements and values in the company. The employee has certain uh, aspirations where he is now versus where he wants to be. And the same thing with the company. So the company is also an organism that evolves, that grows. Now, if you can align where the company wants to go and where the employee wants to go, if you're going in the same direction, that is very strong. That's what you want in a company. But then we have the element of cultural dominance, uh, lenience, positive uh, limiting elements. If as a company, you have a clear culture statement, cultural elements that are dominant, that you want to be dominant in your employees. And it's, this is not, um, doesn't put any, any uh, value on, on whatever that is. One company may be a company where you are very service oriented and another company may only value employees who go and push through sales and don't care about service. There's no judgment on that, but you need to know as a company what is important for you. So if the, the dominant elements in culture between employee and company are aligned, if not now, certainly for the future where they want to go, then again, you have a strong, uh, a, a strong team. If on the other hand, you see that an employee shows limiting uh, cultural elements, things that are not going to work in the organization, you can be very clear about where the organization wants to go and where you want the employee to go. And if that doesn't work out over a couple of months in specific follow-up of the employee through regular assessments to KPIs, you can then uh, say goodbye and to the employee or advise the employee to go to another employer. If you look at the culture statement from um, Netflix, if you don't know it, Google it. Netflix, the culture way. It's very interesting. It makes it very clear what the dominant cultural elements are. So that's, that's a little bit in a very simple graph, how we approach the, the values and the culture in a company. Next, please. Now, I was talking in the previous slide about values. If you wanna specifically talk about cultural elements, there's a very good um, methodology that has been developed by Erin Meyer, M-E-Y-E-R, Erin Meyer. And Erin has a, a, a cultural map, which can be applied across regions, countries, companies, with a number of different uh, um, axes. So you have the communication, X. Do you communicate in a very low context, meaning very clearly and direct, or in a very high context, meaning you make references to uh, cultural elements around you? The example here is the comparison between the US and China. China talks very much in a contextual way. When certain words are used, they make reference implicit to certain poems, poems with certain connotations, and that whole complex uh, meaning, web of meaning around that world is conveyed, and that gives you 
the deeper meaning of what is being communicated. In the US, people are much more direct. However, if you would look at the Netherlands, people are even more direct than in the US. And the important point to make here is that you just need to know where you are compared to your counterpart, your counterpart being target one or target two. And the relative position of communication, that is what counts. Next thing is evaluating. Do you give direct negative feedback or do you give indirect negative feedback? In China, it's very impolite to give uh, direct negative feedback. So you don't do that. It makes people look bad. Same thing with leading. Do you lead from the top down or are you more egalitarian? Decision making, top down decision making or consensus. How do you trust someone? In the West, we are used to trusting someone if he says what he is doing. And if he does what he said that he was going to do, very much task-based. You promise something, you stick to your promise, and you deliver. In Asia, it's much more relationship-based. You trust somebody because you, you know his brother. Some, or you, have, you went out with him or something. Disagreeing. Do you go for the confrontation or do you avoid confrontation? Scheduling is related to time. Do you stick? To a specific time you meet at two are you there at two or ten minutes before two or will you arrive some time during the day flexible time and then persuading do you persuade people by being very specific or by being holistic uh, maybe a french approach again um, this is just facts and when you enter into a negotiation it's good to know already from a national point of view where you are on the scale and where your counterpart is on the scale and you can uh, call out the elephant in the room just by saying you know i'm from holland i'm very direct uh, i apologize if if it comes across uh, very impolitely but I, uh, this is a bit how we work and i understand this is different for you if you just name it i was um last month in south africa a deal between a dutch company South African company, different cultures in South Africa. You have the legacy um, immigrants and you have the native population. And then you have the Dutch who come in to negotiate. Well, I had this slide out with the uh, different groups in South Africa with Holland, just to name it. And that already defused the situation. So this is a little bit uh, a practical approach on, on, on how we go about with culture and this is something you can do yourself as well on the web google erin meyer e-r-i-n-m-e-y-e-r -E -E we'll also put that in an email back to you and you can uh, go online put in a couple of countries and do this for yourself next please Uh, last one of the last slides before we go to Q&A is then, well, how do you integrate this into the overall effort of integrating a company? We had the facts, the orange bar, going for the facts. For, of course, first resolving immediate, immediate cultural impact issues. Then we had the data gathering, we had the diagnostic, and we had the map where we want to go as a company. Now you can create tasks around that. You can create focus groups. You can create tasks by business function across geographies. You can create tasks um, ac across the time, doing some things first, other things later. But we're talking about tasks, actions, people who execute them, and following up on things. And that's exactly what we do in any other work stream when we integrate a company. We do this for IT, we do this for ERP, we do this for process integrations. So it is very easily fits into your regular approach of doing an integration. It becomes part of any work stream and it becomes part of the work stream action tracking. 
Thank you, Jen. Thanks, Christoph. We're now ready for our Q&A portion. We have a couple of questions that have come in. Um, if you have more questions, please type them into the Q&A box and we can answer them as they come in. One question that came in, can you give us some examples on how to assess the culture, the current cultures of both acquire and target before signing? Scott, would you like to take that one? Well, I think we kind of um, uh, hit that. Uh, Might've come in before we got to that section, but um, I'll answer the question uh, that I'm sure to come up and, and it's when, and which is a really good one. Um, you know, you, you want to tend to front load that and get that information early. But remember to do it, as we've discussed, you're gonna to have to uh, talk to people, do an assessment, and you can't do that until people are aware of the transaction. And a lot of times until you get to signing or close, there may be a limited amount of people that are in the know. Um, so you really have to calibrate your timing around when the organization is aware of it. And they've had a little time to kind of digest it so you then have some, some good data. Um, so it, it, I guess the, the answer is it depends, um, but you don't want to do it and all of a sudden come out with a cultural assessment where people don't know why you're doing that. Um, that, that just creates more anxiety. Thank you. We have another one. Um, question is, are you giving the assessment to management or all staff? Monique, would you like to take that one? <clears throat> Thank you. It depends on uh, the phase that you're in in, in, due diligence, in due diligence. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah. yeah. In, in due diligence, um, you know, as Scott mentioned, you can't necessarily get into assessments, but you can do some observations and, and be able to see some of the differences when the, the two different parties are at the table. Um, and one of the things that um, you'll be able to see is, you know, the cultural differences, for instance, is just the, you know, if there's any hierarchical items like, like Christoph pointed out. And um, once you get past signing, as, as Scott said, then you have the ability to be able to do more of those assessment type deals. Um, and so that makes it a little bit easier to do those assessments. Monique, allow me to give two examples. Um, one, one is just a fact that uh, Philips now does cultural due diligence and they just walk away from a potential target if the cultural DD already says that there is no fit. And then a very specific example. A target was a um, value-added reseller of an ERP system. Uh, so what are the assets? It's the, the customer contracts and it's the people. And the target was very consensually organized, not a lot of hierarchy. There were two companies bidding for the target, one with about the same DNA as the target, and the other, uh, culturally speaking, the opposite, definitely when it came to hierarchy, top-down decision-making. The one, the hierarchical one, won the bidding war. But what happened, there was such a cultural clash that the top performers of the target just went away, took their customers with them, and went to the other company that lost the bidding war. And eventually, as an acquirer, you end up with an empty box, just to show how important culture can be. I saw a question come in um, about, um, have you ever seen, um, I think a successful um, integration where cultures were really different. And uh, I wanted to answer that because I thought it was a good question. You know, I, I will say in general, I've not seen, you know, things just splatter out and be, um, and, and not go through because of culture. Um, there's a lot of other reasons things are bumpy in the integration process. Um, you know, culture certainly is one of them. Has it been the, it, it, have I ever experienced where people are pointing to that and say that alone is the reason um, this is not working out? Uh, I, ca I can't think of any. Um, I can tell you something we did recently in the telecom space. Uh, I'll protect the, the companies that we worked with. Um, they were very different. 
Um, and it was a concern of ours going in how different they were um, after we did the assessment on a lot of the dimensions Christoph uh, shared. What we found though was their approach to new product development and innovation was quite similar. They were you know, both on the leading edge, both very prideful in, in their efforts to be kind of ahead of the market, how they approached it, you know, the robustness of the, their processes. And so we, we, we latched onto that and kind of used that as, you know, the, the North Star, if you will, for culture in terms of, hey, look at, we're, we're very alike in a very important area for both of us and this industry. And, um, you know, and built upon that. And yes, the other differences, you know, were sometimes annoying and, um, you know, created frustration. Um, but when we held that one up and continued to use it, you know, kind of as a centerpiece for our efforts, it seemed to make a difference with a lot of people since it was so important in their industry. Let me, uh, let me read a couple questions here, and then I'll toss to uh, Christoph or Monique. Um, I think there, there's a question here about um, kind of in, in terms of cultural due diligence, what are the techniques you are given, use given the limitations of contact to the employees and need for confidentiality? I think I answered part of that in terms of when you do it, but Monique or Christoph, any other thoughts on that question? Monique, I gave it to you. So during due diligence, often it's it's really just about the the things that you're observing and that you can't necessarily really ask about. So being on site or being at the table with both parties is very useful because you can start seeing um, the the differences and the answers and how they're going about things, how they make decisions. Um, how they're going about their strategies, you can start seeing some of it at, at that point. And if um, I think there's a, a question about, you know, there's personalities that are going to con consider the financial, legal, and regulatory requirements, number one, and there's going to be some parties at the table who are going to consider the people part in their wallet issues to be number one. And so you're just going to be able to see, again, what those the the priorities and the values are between the different companies in there, but it, it's not typically a formalized tool at that point. I yeah, want to uh, jump in. Oh, go ahead, Christoph. Thanks. If I can jump in there. Indeed. So we have Aaron Meyer. That's the way of approaching things. Uh, if you look at the Economist uh, Accenture survey, you look at the clear organizational structure. We've had projects in the past where the acquirer was a family-owned company, a, a large one, uh, acquiring the number two. The family-owned company was had a very fuzzy structure. It was uh, it was the pater familias who knew everything, and everything was in his head. But the communication between the function was very much siloed. So there was no or incomplete communication between them everything was in the master's head. And the target had a very clear organizational structure. So that is already a warning light. So you cannot talk to the employees of the target, but you notice immediately in the Q&A and in just in the org charts that things are very different. So that should already raise uh, warning signs and alarm bells. Yeah. Thanks, Christoph. Um, I'll take a question that, that came in earlier, which is a great one, and talked about, um, you know, how do you convince senior management um, the importance of this when often the attitude is it's, you know, kind of one of the soft things and it's, it, you know, sometimes pleas for um, attention to cultural integration fall on, falls on stony ground. That's a great question, um, and, it, and it comes up a lot. So what uh, we typically do is if you go back to what I spoke about earlier is focus on the, convince them that the things that matter are where we wanna focus and that we're not trying to you know, boil the ocean here and have a kind of a, a soft and unspecific cultural integration effort. No, we are gonna find out where, what's different, um, what matters, what to align on based on the business objectives and, and, and mission and, and values that we want that are going to be critical for NUCO. 
and focus our efforts there. And again, a lot of times their skepticism is assuaged when you talk about focus. We're going to focus on the things that matter. We're going to disregard the other things and not try to solve world, world hunger. Because I think the bias that you get and that pushback you get from se senior management is when they think you're trying to do some big comprehensive, you know, harmonize culture exercise that's not going to focus on things that have tangible business outcomes, and that's where you lose them. Um, let, me, uh, let me go into the questions here for the, for the group with the time we have left. Um, let, me, let me read this. Um, assume you've got a contract to support an M&A. Um, I, I guess she, someone's talking about an engagement. In the first 90 days of helping client and managing IMO, what percentage of effort from external consultants versus total for 90 days do you typically spend on cultural diagnostic and follow-up? Um, I will, uh, I'll take a stab at that and then open it up to the panel. So, you know, typically this, I, as um, I mentioned before, we would consider this part of our integration scope. And yes, it would be part of the first 90 days. The when question that I mentioned earlier is important in terms of when the employee base that you're going to be sampling is in the know, but it's something that you wanna do early um, because you wanna use that efforts to inform your communication and often, uh, it, you know, it influences some of the finer, um, you know, points of your integration plan. If there are things that you have to do, for example, to get safety um, harmonized and get one company up to the standards of the other, well, those are those should manifest as specific integration objectives in, for example, the operations plan or the safety plan. If you, the, you know, if you have your IMO organized that way, so it turns it should turn into specific work. You know, the output is worthless if you're, not, if you're not doing something with it. Either you're using that to inform your communications and really hitting on key messages that you know are important to people, and or you're using it to inform um, uh, initiatives or to uh, specify initiatives in your integration plans. If it's a nice to know thing that you're putting on a shelf after, you're, after you've done it, then shame on you, you're not doing the exercise right. Panel, any other points on that? Yes, Scott. If I often see that uh, the cultural element that that we look at at the start of an assignment, we can almost predict what's going to happen six months later uh, in certain regions with certain people, certain actions. Because um, change management is not so easy when things are ingrained and they are in a company or in a subsidiary and they're not aligned with the overall direction that the company is going. So there are often efforts um, to move things in the right direction, but also very often we need to say, take certain actions, uh, which we already could predict very early on in the deal. So the longer you would wait with doing that assessment, the longer it's gonna take you to take uh, corrective actions. Monique? We can probably get to the, we, since there's only five minutes left, we can probably go to the next one, Scott. Yeah, so um, there's, a, there's a few questions around timing, and let me try to summarize and tie them together for the purposes of answering it. But I think most of the questions are kind of how long does this take until you get to some kind of, you know, harmonized culture? Well, first off, we talked earlier about, you know, that may be an unrealistic goal to think that you're ever going to get to a truly, you know, harmonized culture. Um, it could take years, and here's why. A lot of times, especially with big, um, with larger companies, you may have several pockets of old, older cultures still active, if you will, um, from previous acquisitions from one of the companies. Um, and so, you know, you've still got pockets of that going on to try to get to, you know, where you think, you know, we have one harmonized culture. First of all, how will you know? when it, it's completely harmonized. And again, I think it's an unrealistic goal. What you wanna do is pick off those things, sorry to, to beat a dead horse here, that are the most important things and know when you've gotten there in terms of alignment. Um, and that other stuff I think will come in over time, but I don't, I don't think there's you know, a, a realistic 
date to say ah, it's completely harmonized because I think that goal is unrealistic. Panel? I would agree there, Scott. Okay. Yeah, I would agree too. Um, and another question that um, came in, uh, let me read it. m and success rates are, are still remarkably low. Do you think lack of appreciation to cultural integration is a main contributor to this still low quote unquote success rate or at least a big factor um, in terms of realizing some benefits? Um, I'll, I'll start that and uh, there's more to the question, but I think we, we have the gist. Yeah, I think it is. I think when it's, it, when you're doing nothing to understand it and then firefighting when you have you know flare-ups and you don't know what are the things that you really should prioritize and align around then yeah I think it can be a contributor to um, you know poor results you're not achieving the business objectives or deal thesis things are taking too long um, because people aren't aligned and it you know when when, they, when they're not aligned you, you certainly aren't efficient and the integration is going to take longer. Um, so yeah, I think it ab absolutely can adversely affect um, your integration success rate. Panel? There's actually a, additional um, research that has been done that, that shows that culture is one of the top three reasons that integrations fail. Thank you very much, everybody. Everyone, please stay safe out there. And uh, we look forward to talking to you again in the future. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.